hi, Tanya. Oh, hi, Rahim. How are you doing? I'm fine, and you? I'm good, thank you. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just warming up some soup for lunch. Would you like some? Mmm, yes, please. Okay, let me put the lid back on. I don't want to lose too much water. I don't like thick soup. What do you mean? How does putting the lid on keep the soup from getting thick? The steam still evaporates. Well, it's kind of like what I learned in science today. Really? What did you learn? I learned all about dynamic equilibrium. I don't know what that is. What is dynamic equilibrium? I mean, doesn't equilibrium mean that nothing happens? Objects are at rest. Well, let me show you with this pot of soup right here. What happens when the water evaporates? Well, it moves out of the pot and into the air around us. Okay, I'll put the lid back on. What happens now? Ah, the lid traps the water. And the steam forms droplets on the pot, which moves back down into the pot along the sides. The water changes from a liquid to a gas. But because the lid is back on, it changes from a gas back to a liquid. So that's why you put the lid on. Because the water in the gas form can't escape, so it changes back into liquid water. That's right. But remember that because the pot is on the stove and on a high temperature, this means that the water in the soup carries on evaporating to form water in the gas phase. Does that mean that evaporating and condensation takes place at the same time? It seems like nothing is happening. You've got it. Overall, it seems like there's no change in the amount of liquid water or water in the gas. There's a state of balance or dynamic equilibrium inside the pot. I understand why you say there's equilibrium, but what does dynamic mean? Dynamic tells us that at a microscopic level, water molecules are changing from gas to liquid and liquid to gas all the time, even though it seems like there is no change. That's really interesting. But enough talk about chemistry. That soup smells really good. Is it time to eat? Yes, it is. Pass me the bowl and I'll dish up. That was a very interesting conversation about dynamic equilibrium. In today's lesson, we will explore two examples of dynamic equilibrium. The first example is called phase equilibrium. Here, substances change phase, just like the example of water in the closed container. And the second is called chemical equilibrium. In a closed container, Reactant molecules and product molecules collide with each other continually. But overall, we observe no change in the number of product or reactant molecules. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe what is meant by dynamic equilibrium, represent a phase equilibrium, and a chemical equilibrium by writing down chemical equations and draw and interpret graphs showing chemical equilibrium. <laughs> to help you form a better picture of phase equilibrium, let's take a closer look at what happens to water that is placed into a container. I really can't see anything happening here from a macroscopic view. But when we look at the water from a microscopic view, it's a completely different picture. Molecules of water are leaving the liquid and moving into the air. This process is called evaporation. Molecules of water struggle to break free of the surface, and only those with enough energy can break free. We can represent evaporation by writing an equation. H2O liquid goes to H2O gas. Notice that most of the water molecules leave the surface of the water and move off into the air. However, a few very slow moving molecules are attracted back to the surface of the liquid. We can represent condensation by writing the equation. 
You know that if we leave a glass of water out in the sun, the water will evaporate completely. We will see the water level dropping. But when we put a lid on the container, we prevent the water molecules escaping. Now, watch what happens. The gas region above the liquid becomes very crowded with water molecules. And so, the number of molecules evaporating decreases. But at the same time, the number of water molecules returning to the liquid increases. Until the number of water molecules leaving the liquid is the same as the number of molecules moving from the gas back to the liquid, the rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation. Notice that overall, the number of molecules in the air above the liquid is not changing. We call this a phase equilibrium and represent it by combining the two equations. If we heat or cool the flask, we will affect the rates of the reactions. So it is important to note that phase equilibrium is established under specific conditions. Now phase equilibrium is the first example of a dynamic equilibrium that we will explore. Can you identify the characteristics of a dynamic equilibrium from the example we have studied so far? Compare your list to mine. Dynamic equilibrium happens when we have a closed system. There must be reversible processes that happen at the same time. The rate of the forward process equals the rate of the reverse process. Remember conditions such as temperature, pressure, and concentration must remain constant. On a microscopic view, there is constant change. But on a macroscopic view, it seems as there is no change taking place. Now, let's see how the characteristics of a dynamic equilibrium can be applied to chemical reactions. Some chemical reactions are reversible. For example, when ammonia gas and hydrogen chloride gas react, they form a white cloud of tiny crystals of ammonium chloride at room temperature. And when ammonium chloride is heated, it forms ammonia gas and hydrogen chloride gas. The gases react with each other to reform a white cloud of ammonium chloride. Although these reactions are reversible reactions, this is not an example of a dynamic equilibrium yet. Can you suggest why? For a dynamic equilibrium, we need a closed container, and the forward and reverse reactions must take place under the same conditions at the same time. The rate of the forward reaction must also equal the rate of the reverse reaction. Right, so let's heat some ammonium chloride in a closed container. After a short while, all we can see is that the container is filled with white fumes. There doesn't seem to be any changes taking place. But what's happening at a microscopic level? The ammonium chloride solid decomposes to form ammonia molecules and hydrogen chloride molecules. This is the forward reaction. Notice that at the same time, some hydrogen chloride molecules and ammonia molecules collide to form ammonium chloride as a product. This is the reverse reaction. Also notice that the total number of ammonia molecules and hydrogen chloride molecules remains the same. So the rate of the forward reaction must be equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. We call the dynamic equilibrium established in the closed system a chemical equilibrium. Can you suggest how we can represent the chemical equilibrium in the container? 
For phase equilibrium, we combined the equations for the forward and reverse reactions. Let's do the same here. The forward reaction shows the decomposition of the ammonium chloride to form gases. And the reverse reaction show how the gas combined to form the solid. Next, we turn the reverse reaction around and then we can add the two reactions together. The double arrow shows that the reaction is in a chemical equilibrium. In this chemical equilibrium, the reactant is a solid, but the products are both gases. We call this a heterogeneous chemical equilibrium. Many learners find it hard to understand what it means to have the rate of the forward reaction equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Let's think of the forward reaction as a man throwing apples over his neighbor's wall. At first, only man A throws apples because man B does not have apples to throw. Eventually, man B starts to throw apples back. Think of man B throwing apples back as the reverse reaction. At first, man B is slow at throwing back, but he eventually speeds up. Man A and man B end up throwing apples at the same rate. Can you see that the number of apples on man A's side stays the same, and the number of apples on man B's side stays the same? We say they are in dynamic equilibrium. Chemists like to represent chemical equilibrium using two different graphs. The first graph is the rate of reaction against time, and the second is the concentration of reactants and products against time. Before we draw the graph together, let's take a look at the microscopic view of a reaction. In this closed container, we have molecules of A2 and molecules of B2 at the start of the reaction. The molecules gain energy and begin to move around faster and collide with each other. Some of these collisions are effective and new molecules AB form. At first, there are many effective collisions, and the number of AB molecules increases quickly. But then, molecules of AB start colliding with each other to reform molecules of A2 and B2. The forward and reverse reactions continue to take place at the same time until the number of reactant molecules and product molecules stays constant, and the rates of the reactions are equal. Right, with that microscopic view in mind, let's work out what the graph of reaction rate versus time will look like. We'll show the rate of forward reaction in red, and the rate of the reverse reaction in blue. When the reaction starts, the forward reaction has a high reaction rate. There are many effective collisions, and lots of product molecules form. But as the reactants form products, the rate slows down. At the same time, the reverse reaction starts from no reaction rate and increases. When the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction are equal, chemical equilibrium is established. It's not easy to see when reaction rates are equal. It helps if we measure the number of product or reactant molecules present in a closed system. That's why the second type of graph is important. To draw this graph, we will consider the reaction of nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas to form ammonia gas in a chemical equilibrium. This reaction is important in the fertilizer industry. The reactants and products are all in the same phase in this chemical equilibrium, so we call it a homogeneous chemical equilibrium. 
Let's have a look at the microscopic view of this reaction as we look at the graph. At the start of the reaction, we have a high concentration of hydrogen molecules and a lower concentration of nitrogen molecules indicated by the green line. There are no ammonia molecules at the start. When the forward reaction begins, the number of hydrogen molecules is used up quickly and the concentration decreases sharply. The concentration of nitrogen decreases too, but not as quickly. The concentration of ammonia, the product, increases steadily from zero. The reactants are not all used up because the ammonia molecules break apart to form hydrogen and nitrogen. Now, let's look at the point where the reactions reach chemical equilibrium. Notice all the graphs become less steep and slowly become parallel horizontal lines. At this point, the concentration of the reactants and products is no longer changing. Chemical equilibrium is established. It's important to note that the number of molecules does not need to be equal for chemical equilibrium to be established, but the total number of molecules remains constant. I hope you find these graphs useful in describing and representing and interpreting what happens in a chemical equilibrium. Here's today's task. In a closed one decimeter cubed container, five moles of hydrogen react with four moles of iodine to produce hydrogen iodide. At chemical equilibrium, there are four moles of hydrogen iodide present in the container. One, sketch a graph of reaction rate against time to show chemical equilibrium. Two, Sketch a graph of concentration of the reactants and products showing when chemical equilibrium is established. For more information, please visit our website on www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn.